Welcome back, honors. Welcome back to it. Welcome back to your flip classroom and our continuing discussion of the European Renaissance, right? Well, the European Renaissance, the Italian slash Northern Renaissance, the Renaissance in general, those Renaissance. But let's pick up right where we left off in that last flip, all right? So the last flip we were talking about, why Italy, right? We're discussing why is Italy going to be the focus and or the focal point itself of that Italian Renaissance when it actually starts to go forward. Well, we talked about a lot of different things. We talked about how Italy had become the center of trade. We talked about how like the papal states are located there. And what you're gonna realize as we keep going is there's gonna be a lot of like papal states slash Catholic Church sponsored art, right? When you think of the Sistine Chapel ceiling, y'all, it's in a chapel, right? It's inside of a church. When you think about like so many other ones as well, the Last Judgment, the one with that is on the back wall of the Sistine Chapel. The church paid for those artworks. So them having tons of money is going to be a really, really big reason why they're going to start paying for all that art. But the fact that also that like Italy is the European center for the continent's banking. And then also Italy is going to be as well the location of the former Roman Empire. So there's a lot of ruins around and stuff like that. Now, speaking of like the banking part or the banking stuff, this is also going to tie into something else that's very, very important. The idea of the patron, right? The patron, the person who's paying for the artwork, right? We talked a little bit about patronage and stuff like that during those presentations today, but we kept hearing the same last name come up, right? This one patron patron family come up over and over and over again that bought the birth of Venus, <clears throat> that bought La Primavera, that actually helped pay for Brunelleschi's dome, that did all these different things when they were actually paying for these artworks, right? Well, the thing about it is we got to talk about that family a little bit. That family is known as the Medici family, right? The Medici family of Florence is a great example of a major patronage family that existed in Italy during the Renaissance period, right? The Medici family of Florence is so important, in fact, that I think somewhere in the neighborhood of seven of the artworks out of the 12 that are being presented on in y'all's class are Medici artworks that they actually paid for and financed, right? And who are these people? Well, well, there are the informal, informal a little bit, rulers of Florence for over 300 years, right? The Medici family is the, are the, is the family that got so rich because they created the most powerful bank in European history up to that point, okay? So inside of the city of Florence, the Medici family bank kept safe a lot of people's different, or a lot of different people and other family, another royal family and noble family's finances, kept it all in one central location and y'all I don't know if you know how banks work but banks legit spend your money whenever you give it to them like so if you go up to a bank like a bank right now and you actually go and you're like hey here's my money all right keep it safe for me please they're gonna then take that money and loan it out to other people they're gonna use it to pay their bills they're gonna do all this other stuff but since so many people are bringing them funds they're all just kind of hinging on the fact that not everybody's gonna show up on the same day and ask for their money back because theoretically speaking if I I drop my money off and then Mackenzie Ori comes in and she wants some money as well for a loan they're gonna give her some of my money but then if I come back and actually ask for my money back they're gonna give me somebody else's money it's like a really big shell game right but this concept and this idea led to them being able to have so much money on hand at one time that they literally would bribe the government of Florence all the time and basically use their money and influence to rule from the background right they lived in one of the biggest houses inside of Florence this thing known as the uh Palazzo della or the yeah yeah, no, the Palazzo del Vecchio, right? Which is this really, really big place called the Old Castle, right? So they are huge patrons of artworks. They even let one of them, a very famous one, this guy right here, his name is Lorenzo Il Magnifico Medici, right? He literally is known as the Magnificent. He let Michelangelo live with him for a little while just to help foster his development, right? So like now, and then that's Cosimo the Elder right there that really started off the whole shebang, right? Now going into it though, the Medici family is gonna be biggie, big, biggie, big heavy financiers of art because they love to decorate their home with it. They love to use it to, create, like, to make like housewares and stuff like that. Just to show you what I mean by patronage and stuff like that, one of the two groups, I think it's Ali and Mackenzie Ori are actually presenting on this Perseus holding the head of Medusa. Well, Cellini, the guy that made their artwork, also is is very, very famous for making this other thing known as the Cellini Salt Cellar, right? The Cellini Salt Cellar was made for Francis I, King of France, right? Of the Valois lineage and dynasty. And it's literally a salt shaker for his table, right? So like, it's a salt cellar that uses a spoon and stuff like that and you spread salt on your food or whatever. That bad boy right there is made out of gold, rolled enamel and ivory. And it's insured for up to $65 million. That is a $60 million 
salt shaker, right? So like just to give you an idea of what these people are paying for, right? They didn't just buy art and just buy sculptures. They bought houseware, tapestries, custom made dishware and stuff like that made by Renaissance artists, right? It's like you got Michelangelo making your bedspread. You know what I'm talking about? That's how wealthy these people were. And it was a derivation away from the other things that people used to buy when they were super, super rich before this during the Middle Ages, which was a lot of like suits of armor and things like that or expansionary like areas onto their homes and stuff. But the thing about it is, is what's making or how is the economy of the era, how is the increased economics of Europe at the time leading to all this better art and all this patronage of art? Well, a lot of it has to do with the injection of funds into this like particular field, which is going to push artwork forward and actually force artists to compete with each other. And since just like economics, competition makes the economy stronger, art is going to become stronger because of said competition as well. And all the art that begins to originate from the Renaissance period that mirrors a lot of old Roman and Greek art as well is going to be much more stylized than it was during the Middle Ages. It's going to represent humans and landscapes in both like kind of a two-dimensional and also three-dimensional feel with vanishing points and other multiple layers to it. Perspective is going to be used where they're actually going to use depth and proportions and shading as well to make the art look more textured in real, right? Sculptors are also going to study human anatomy, like Vitruvian Man, right? Like Leonardo da Vinci's Vitruvian Man, to figure out how to get the arms the right length so I can make sure by measuring the body itself, and then actually I'll be able to find the height from fingertip to fingertip, right? So that's all going to be really, really important, and it's all mirroring the ideals of the ancient Romans, right? That right there is an ancient Roman sculpture that's Augustus at Ponte Verde, right? That right there is in the Vatican Museum. That was made during Augustus's rule and then close to his actual eventual death in 17 AD or no, 17 BC. Now, the thing that we need to understand though about Augustus and the statue, that's Roman y'all, that's ancient Roman, but look how good it was, right? And then this right here is, that's Middle Ages art, right? Like, so like, mm, it's looking kind of crusty. Uh, it's like, yeah, it doesn't have any depth. That's supposed to be the crowning of Charlemagne and stuff like that. He's like, everybody kind of has the same face. Nobody has expressions or emotions. Now, this is high Middle Ages art, high late Middle Ages art. It's getting better, right? They've got like gold leafing and stuff like that. But still, there's just something not quite right about Mary and baby Jesus' face. But then as time begins to roll forward, you begin to see a massive leap forward in the scale of art in the 1400s, right? There's the birth of Venus that was made in the 1480s. This one right here is another one by Botticelli, right? And Botticelli did this famous one known as Madonna with Pomegranate, right? This is one of his other works that I actually like just just as much as the birth of Venus and then also the Primavera because of the symbolism that's inside of it, right? So that's the other thing about art during this time period is that everything was placed there with a purpose, right? There are symbols all over the place. And my favorite symbol in this particular painting is the fact that baby Jesus right here, instead of having the sacred heart above his like actual image, you know, the sacred burning heart of Christ, Instead, he's got this pomegranate sitting right there, right? Well, because the idea is supposed to be <clears throat> that he has yet to sacrifice his life for, like, mankind, but the pomegranate is meant to represent the place and location of where that sacred heart will one day go. And the pomegranate is there right over top of baby Jesus' heart to show one particular thing. All the red seeds inside the pomegranate represent the individual drops of blood that that child will one day, say, like, like, spend to save humanity, right? So that right there is a great symbol that's actually like very much ingrained onto the inside of this particular one. There's Gabriel in the background and we know it's him because he's holding lilies, right? So the thing about it is like all these symbols and stuff like that in art is going to give us that Renaissance art, which is a product of those good economics, right? Architecture is going to be another really big one as well. We talked about that today when we're talking about Brunelleschi's dome and stuff like that, which will be moving away from the disorderly looking Gothic style, which is this one right here, with the spires and the pointed roofs and the pointed arches and the universal stone construction and the high vaulted seats feelings in those flying buttresses. So like all that stuff, right? The architecture, also known as the social art, by the way, because everyone can see it and experience it, is going to do away with that very disorderly Gothic style. And it's going to move towards things like Brunelleschi's Dome, where things are much more clean and Roman and Greco-Roman. They're going to incorporate domes again that haven't been seen since the Pantheon, right? Like so, since the actual Pantheon was built by Marcus Agrippa under the reign of Augustus, or began to be built by Marcus Agrippa under the reign of Augustus. So, like, you can actually see that, like, clean, symmetrical look, right? Using those ribbed vaults to actually create the vaulted ceiling rather than a flying buttress. So that's going to be much nicer. They're going to reincorporate pillars again. They're going to bring back pediments to buildings, and they're going to make it look 
better, right? And cleaner and nicer. Now, some of you are like, I like the Gothic one. I mean, me too. I don't like, I don't dislike it, you know? But they're also going to incorporate frescoes onto the insides of those domes right there. That's Vasari's Last Judgment on the inside of the dome. And that right there is the devil eating a naked guy. And we'll talk about that a little bit later on when we get to Dante's Inferno and stuff like that. But speaking of Dante's Inferno, aka the Divine Comedy, we got to understand one other big thing. Art is often sometimes viewed as visual art, right? Oh, the visual arts. Oh, yes, a fresco, a painting, a this, a that, right? So like now, but what we need to understand is that writing is a heavy element, a heavy, heavy element to the Renaissance period. And you could actually argue that writings, books, and literature is actually the first form of art to appear in the Renaissance, right? Because as we remember, you know, monks and nuns were working their way, their days away in convents and monasteries, copying things over from one place to another. And like, you know, books were extremely expensive. They were hand decorated and stuff like that. But the thing about it is the earliest artwork to originate from the Renaissance period is going to be in those monasteries and convents. When people begin to sit down and write their perspectives on philosophy and scholarly subjects to translate the former works of Aristotle and try to actually understand how does that relate to like Christianity and stuff like that. They're going to write guidebooks for men and women to achieve success and all of this comes before the things like the birth of Venus and the Primavera and everything else. So you could actually argue that writings are the bedrock of the Renaissance period. And one of my favorite writers to always start off with is a famous one that we actually say a prayer to every time we have exams, right? This guy is none other than St. Thomas Aquinas, right? Who is actually from the late Middle ages or being most active in the 1220s he's actually going to be one uh he has a funny little nickname he was known as the big dumb ox because he was like a really really big guy and he was really kind of quiet and stuff like that and everybody thought he was kind of not smart but it actually turns out that saint thomas aquinas was brilliant right and he actually re like did a very very in-depth study where he redid and translated the works of aristotle to try and better understand greco philosophy and how it relates to religion right so he rebirthed aristotle's works and he's considered the guy that focused in on that rebirth of scholasticism right Right? His work to translate philosophers' works and then apply it to Christianity is known as the scholastic fields, right? Trying to take other different disciplines and add it to what he's already studying, okay? And so one of the things he ended up doing is he actually translated Aristotle's works and he tried to quantify something because he said that when he was like actually looking at Aristotle's works, Aristotle was all about experience and observation and stuff like that. But St. Thomas Aquinas as a monk was like, but there's so many things that I have to study that I can't see, so how do I do that? And he began to write essays on all kinds of different things. Essays, for example, he did one called On the Soul, right? On the Soul was his study on does the soul of a human being exist here? Or is it in another space, right? Is it in a, is it corporeal is the uh, like question he also uh, argued quite often, right? But he's taking... Old, dead, like like ancient Greek words and applying them to his life. That doesn't get much more humanistic than that, right? St. Thomas Aquinas is one of our most important writers, and he begins that entire trend. But nobody, nobody is probably as important as our next guy. None other than... Dante Aglieri, right? Dante Algieri or whatever. Dante, but we can just call him Dante. He's a lot like Prince, you know what I mean? Like, he just gets one name because that's all he needs because it's Prince, you know what I mean? But Dante, Dante Aglieri or Dante Algieri, okay, is going to be a very, very important Renaissance writer because Dante is going to actually bring back vernacular literature, right? Vernacular fiction as well, who's actually from the early 1300s and he's going to be most active during the 1330s. Now, the biggest thing about Dante is he brought back epic poetry and he wrote it in vernacular language. I need you to write that word down, all right? That word is very important, vernacular language. His poem that he's most well known for is called the Divine Comedy, right? Now, he wrote a bunch of different other stuff, right? But his most enduring work is known as the Divine Comedy, right? Now, the famous work of the Divine Comedy is he wrote a poem about basically his journey through the afterlife, right? And the way the entire story goes, and also, by the way, it was written in Italian, right? The fact that it's written in Italian is a really, really big deal because it's not written in Latin, right? Most of whatever, like, St. Thomas Aquinas' works were all written in Latin because they were meant for monks and nuns to read and other people who could actually read the Bible, right? But Don Dante wanted his actual like words to we reach a wider audience. And he was like, I'm Italian, so I'm going to write this in Italian. So other Italians who know how to read can go off and read my book, right? And his book, known as the Divine Comedy, starts off with this whole misty forest that he enters into, and it's in three different parts, right? His book is over 14,000 lines, and it's in three different parts. It's in like nine, like, it's like uh, several cantos. I think it's like several hundred cantos. I think it's like 900, but I got to look that up. The thing about it, though, is like when we're looking at this, 
His poem is in three separate parts, right? And he journeys through the afterlife. And when he goes there, he walks through hell. He walks through purgatory and he goes through heaven. Known in his book as the Inferno, per, or Purgatorio and Paradiso, right? Which is actually the Italian words for hell, purgatory, and heaven, right? And the coolest thing about it is he's apparently actually chasing this old flame. Ironically enough, he was married at the time to a different woman, but this woman that he actually knew named Beatrix had died and stuff like that. And he was like, oh, that was my first love and stuff like that. And in the entire story, he wakes up in this like misty forest and he doesn't know where he is. And he's like, what's going on? And he hears this voice in the distance and he goes, Dante. And he's like, that's her, that's Beatrix. And he starts following the voice through this forest, right? And he comes up to the base of a mountain and he's like, it's coming from up there. I got to get up to her. She's higher up. I got to get up there. He tries to climb this mountain. And all of a sudden, a leopard, a wolf, and a lion come running down the mountain. I'm like, you can't go up there. And they tell them, they tell them to turn back. And then he's like, well, how am I supposed to get to her? And then his guide arrives, right? Of course, as we know, in a lot of epic poetry, there's always a guide. There's somebody that knows the way that's going to show you the way, right? And the person that shows up is none other than, for any of you that have taken Latin or have taken Latin before, this very famous poet known as Virgil, who was an ancient Roman poet, shows up. He wrote the Aeneid. He's considered to be the most famous Roman poet of his era. Shows up and he's like, don't worry, Dante. I'll show you the way. And literally, Dante freaks out because it's like he's fanboying over it. It'd be like if Julius Caesar showed up and took me on a guide through the past, right? So literally, he's just like, oh, and he's freaking out about it. And Virgil decides, he's like, but to get to heaven where she is, we must first go through hell, right? And they travel through hell, the mountain of purgatory, and then also into heaven. And y'all, when they go through hell, it's wild. Well, first of all, one of the coolest things about hell is when they're about to walk through the gates of hell above this iron gate that apparently separates the mouth of hell, which of course was referenced in Cameron Ellerbush's uh, in like like uh, like Last Judgment and stuff like that. When they go to walk through the mouth of hell, this tunnel that will lead them downstairs and end up going into this other new realm where people are being punished for all of eternity. There's this big iron gate and across the top of that iron gate, written says abandon hope all ye who enter here and I have a sign above the door of my classroom that when you're walking in you can actually see and it says abandon hope all ye who enter here because it's like welcome to hell right so now look big thing about it though is he then ends up going through hell in the nine different circles of hell Just like looking upon the people who are being punished and stuff like that that are actually being punished for all of their different sins the lustful are actually located right here the gluttons and the slothful are actually located right here here are the sloths actually like not, not like sloths or like in utopia but sloths actually being rained on writhing in the the mud and stuff like that drowning in their own like laziness the gluttons are also here the prideful as well they're rolling bags of their own things at each other in a medieval joust and then you get to the wall of dis and the wall of dis is supposed to separate the violent centers from the non-violent centers and so as you go down through here you end up in like a forest where like you're a tree and then like they like like harpies rip you apart there are these like like ones that have caverns of uh what's called cauldrons that are underneath the ground and it's for priests that sold church offices and the entire time you actually notice whenever he's walking through hell Dante really doesn't like Greeks like so he was like oh the Greeks are the pagans but Romans introduced Christianity to the world so they're awesome like so it's really really funny because he like sees uh what you call it um Alexander the Great like drowning in a river of blood and stuff like that it's a very very awesome book to actually look into and I highly suggest that you go and check out overly sarcastic productions tour of the of the actual inferno and the afterlife and stuff but my favorite level of hell is none other than the very last one right where the devil is at the very very bottom okay and he's down there at the very bottom and he is the one being punished the most right but we'll talk about what he looks like in class tomorrow a little bit because it's kind of a fun little thing and we'll talk about how the bottom of hell is not hot but it's actually cold but i'll see y'all then y'all have a good one